Okay, good morning. Oh, it's soon. Good morning. Oh, good. Okay. okay. I'll uh, continue my uh, speech from yesterday a little bit, a little bit faster because there was a bit too much detail in there yesterday, I think, and I got a lot to cover today. Um, I'll go over it fairly quickly uh, just to show you what's there in the presentations. But all the presentations are already online in the 2018 version. And for most of them, the only thing that changed this year was the copyright notice. So, <laughs> um, But the new ones will be up there uh, maybe tonight or tomorrow or something like that. Okay. We should copy those to Warp Stock website too. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll send them to you or okay, whatever. Or hand them to you on a stick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one that changed a little bit more with two or three new slides is the one that details the uh, new features that have been added in the last couple of versions, actually since uh, 2014. Since uh, was my last presentation on Warpstock, which will be my last presentation for today. Uh, and after that one, I'll uh, have s hopefully still have some time to do some demoing and uh, answer questions, more questions. If there are any questions along the way, just ask. It's the best way to do it. Okay, let's get back to the presentation we had. Oh, that's the wrong one. There we go. File systems. This is where we left off. We mentioned the, the FAT file systems. This is HPFS, uh, designed by Microsoft and IBM together uh, to overcome shortcomings in FAT, uh, mainly for performance and efficiency reasons, uh, capacity, stuff like that. Should be able to use page down today, which is a lot easier than using the mouse. There we go. Uh, so it could allow for larger files. Uh, Longer file names, stuff like that. It's using B trees for performance reasons, so it can get quickly to uh, its directory information, much more quicker than the FAT, where you basically had a linear list of uh, stuff to search through. So that's why it's faster. This is what it looks like. Just like FAT, it has a boot record with, with some basic uh, de uh, information in there. It has super blocks, just like uh, most uh, Unix uh, file system have which describe where most of the other uh, internal data will be for SPFS. Um, then it will have a data area with, with some bitmaps, volume administration, uh, and finally the actual data. What is the spare block? Sorry? The, the spare block. The spare, well, um, one is called super block, the other one is called spare, okay. uh, but, but they're just uh, enhancing each other. It's just, uh, okay. we, we may have a look at it later. It's basically one one administrative area, okay. two sectors. The one sector probably wasn't enough. Okay, then in the data, which is that's it, kind of interesting, uh, most uh, file systems have their allocation information in some kind of central information, like a large bitmap that describes the whole volume. In HPFS, it's it's all it's distributed in, in smaller uh, things they call data bands. <coughs> every data band, I think it's only 16 megs, because they used to fit the, the old uh, hard disks, <coughs> which were a couple of hundred megs. And every one of those bands has uh, its own little bitmap. So if you look at an empty formatted HPFS uh, system, and you look at the allocation map in, in DFC, what you will see is a large area, and then all small spickles uh, of sectors that are used by those little bitmaps. And that's actually one of the problems with this, well not really a problem, but one of the things you'll see is that if you put large files on them, they will be fragmented uh, by default because uh, 16 meg is the largest thing you can put somewhere because that's where the next little bitmap will be for the next band. Oh. So you cannot, you cannot write uh, a gigabyte file to HPFS and not have it fragmented. <coughs> Uh, the way the, the, the files are administered is that there will be uh, 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 will be a file node, which is the, the basic information about a file, like the things like size and, and attributes, and uh, also uh, uh, the file allocation will be will be pointed by uh, by that. Um, and the superblock knows where to find those app nodes uh, and the actual for an actual file or directory that will be pointed to by uh, some information in a directory. Um, 
and then from the F node there will be information to find the actual data for the file. Okay, I'll not get into many details. Uh, what you'll usually see on HPFS is that uh, the files F node, so the, the basic information about a file, will be just before the actual file data. So the, the file nodes are scattered across the whole volume. Unlike things like uh, uh, Linux EXT file systems or some others, where all the uh, file nodes, which are called inodes there, uh, will be in a single area altogether, and then the data will be elsewhere. Uh, this is uh, sometimes easy if you're doing data recovery, because you'll know that if you find an F node for a file, you know that the data is probably right behind it, even if things are damaged. Directory blocks are a little bit larger and have basically uh, got entries that are uh, organized in, in some kind of B3 fashion to make it easily uh, searchable and fast. Fragmented files use intermediate <coughs> structures <coughs> called allocation sectors that have uh, more indirection pointers and stuff like that to more data. But I said all the information is uh, is already on the website, so if you're interested in the details, just have a look there. Oh, this was the super block, I think. Yeah, this is what's in the super block, basically. I think the difference is that the super block is uh, more stable in the sense that it's only changing when you're reformatting or do real uh, heavy stuff. Um, <coughs> and the spare block. <coughs> may have more dynamic stuff. There's things like uh, code page information because all the files in HPFS have a, a code page number assigned. So you can have uh, two active uh, code pages on an HPFS volume and, and switch between them. Or actually there can be more. It, it's always to itself that it has two, two uh, uh, code pages active at the most. Okay, then over to the next, NTFS, New Technology File System. Uh, it looks a bit like HPFS, it was developed in the same time frame, a little bit later, by Microsoft. Uh, and, and just like OS2 and Windows NT, uh, they're very similar. Uh, although NTFS, uh, by design, is a little bit more modern, uh, and internally it looks a lot like a database. There's, there's a really large table, called the Master File Table, that has a uh, database kind of records, two kilobytes each, which uh, both describe each file or directory, and for smaller files also contain the whole contents of the file. So only if, if files are larger, there will be pointers from that uh, file table record to other sectors or clusters of data on the, on the volume. Didn't NTFS go through a pretty major change in the 19, late 90s? Uh, well, there have been some changes, but uh, most of the changes that are being shouted out as being totally new and yeah. uh, whatever are actually layers on top of NTFS. Oh, the base okay. file system below is still pretty the much... Well, there have been new... Let's put it this way. The design is still the same, yeah. but because it's a database kind of thing, what they did is add new attributes, add new stuff, but, mm -hmm. but the structure is all the same. So. Okay. Even DFC can still display all that stuff. It just, I just have to new, uh, have to add new attribute names and stuff like that to make it make the display more readable. Okay. Uh, but the, st uh, the structure, the way it works, is still the same as it was 15 years ago. Wow. Yeah, is, it, is it document? It's proprietary, right? NTFS. Uh, yeah, it is proprietary. But there's, of course, there's uh, uh, Linux drivers and and people writing those have written up some documentation. I've been investigating a lot. Uh, I've got some uh, in information on NTFS on my website as well. <coughs> so let's say officially it's proprietary, but there's a lot of information out there. <laughs> Enough to uh, to write drivers for. It. Okay, internally it uses 64 a bit uh, numbers for about everything, so that there there's really no size limits in NTFS, <coughs> uh, except for some few design choices, but uh, it can take a lot. Uh, 
It uses uh, Unicode internally, so uh, two byte, uh, well, basically two, byte, two or more bytes for uh, scattered encoding, uh, <coughs> making it a lot easier to uh, use other languages with NTFS. Uh, it's, it's a somewhat better mechanism than uh, using code pages like OS2 does, and Windows still does in some ways. And funny thing is that uh, almost all the NTFS file systems actually also keep an 8.3 name. Uh, one of the attributes in a, in, a, in a master file table record is, uh, is, is called the name record, but there can be multiple of those. So you can have a, a Unicode name, an 8.3 name, and even other types of names, although those are rarely used. But almost any file in NTFS will have two, on Windows that is, it will have two name entries. Volume, boot record, just like most PC file systems. Um, and from there, actually, uh, it's all data space. And, and usually there's a reserved area somewhere in the middle. It's called the, uh, the MFT zone. Uh, that's where the, the master file table will be located by default. Because <coughs> they do that because uh, to optimize searching over the volume. Uh, but actually, the MFT, just like anything else on, on NTFS, is just a file itself as well. So there is an MFT record for the MFT. The very first record in the MFT describes the MFT itself. And usually it's a contiguous file, it's pre-allocated, uh, but if you, if, you got, if you fill up your volume then it will get fragmented and just like any other file. Yeah. Nice. Can the MFT be moved or does that make it the minimum size? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, it can be moved, but it's tricky. The, the, most of the resizing tools uh, will not move the, the MFT because it's rather complex. Uh, that's why usually, because it's somewhere in the middle by default, if you resize something, uh, for instance using DFC, you'll probably be able to resize it up to about half the size, but not much smaller. Yeah. And at the moment DFC does not have provisions to move the MFT. It is possible, but it's, it's rather complex because <coughs> it contains all the allocation stuff and, and you have to find new free space. And, and it's, mm -hmm. it's What DFC basically does is just truncate. So we'll, we'll see wh where's the last, the last used uh, stuff <coughs> and, and uh, truncate the, the volume to that size. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you go to move stuff, then it gets complicated. And there are better tools. Actually, the, since Windows 7, I think, Windows uh, brings its own uh, resizing tools, mm -hmm. which are supported by Microsoft, so that's what I tend to use. So. Why, why do something uh, over when, when the official manufacturer does the same thing? So. Okay, there's some special files. You normally won't see those as an end user. But if you know the, the right commands, you can actually do a directory <coughs> command to show those in the root directory. Uh, one of them is the MFT itself. There's a mirror of it for redundancy. There's lots of other things like a journaling log and volume information. MFT record 5 is the root directory. That's where everything else starts off from, of course. More details about special files. An MFT record is just a collection of attributes, and, and the attributes are, are of uh, variable size. Uh, so if, if you know that structure and you know how to interpret it, you can just walk that chain of attributes to see what's in the MFT record. Uh, by default, there's just one kilobyte, uh, but they can be chained. So if the, if the MFT record is full, it will just chain to an, the next one. So some, some of the special files uh, are used <coughs> so heavily, like the security, <coughs> the security <coughs> file. Uh, you sometimes have something like 15 or 20 MFT records describing that single file. Which makes for a very <laughs> lengthy display if you display that file in DFC, because it's by default it will go the whole chain, and then you've got pages and pages of mm. details you're probably not interested in. Uh, those are a few of the attributes that can be in the MFT records for NTFS. And as you can see, there's actually a special one for OS2. Huh? OS2 EAs. They have a special uh, dedicated attribute for that. 
and the data for files in NTFS is also generic, uh, so there can be multiple data streams, uh, and the default one is just what we would call the data for the file, but there can be other ones that have metadata or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, just like the, the old Mac file systems had a, a data stream and mm -hmm. an Resource. The fork, resource data fork and, and whatever. Fork. Oh, yeah, resource, yeah. resource fork. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's called. <coughs> so you can very easily implement that in, in, in TFS. And that's what they do. If they use it as a file server, it will actually just allocate a second stream for the, uh, the Mac resources. Okay, JFS. Originally designed for AIX, so for the RS6000 uh, line of computers, Unix. Uh, and ported to OS2, and unfortunately at some point that port and the whole of OS2 was abandoned, so the JFS implementation is, is functionally almost complete, but it's not as stable as we would like. Uh, but it's still being worked on somewhat, so uh, we even got a bootable one by now, used in Ecom Station and Arc OS. <coughs> The, uh, just back to that for a moment, that the source code that was released was like the latest IBM version of JFS. Sorry? The? The, you said there's open source. Yeah, th that was the one that was used by um, mm, by IBM for the initial port. It was, was put out in, as open source and was, was uh, used by the Linux community to, to build their JFS driver for Linux. And from there on, they deferred it a little bit. They, they added some stuff that was Linux specific, so at the moment uh, you can you can actually use uh, um, Linux to look at your OS2 JFS volumes, but the other way around you sometimes got problems because there's extra information, they got directory <coughs> indexing stuff that OS2 doesn't support, so if you're looking at a JFS volume from Linux using an OS2 system, you'll probably see some weird things. And the source that they published then in OS2 it progressed some more and we don't have that or what, what's up? No, well I'm not sure how exactly the source is developed but I know that the uh, the latest one, the bootable one, I think mm -hmm. Stephen worked somewhat on it. And what they released cannot be used to build an OS2. Like exactly, OS2. yeah. yeah it was meant out. Yeah. So, so what we have is, is based on the original IBM uh, stuff. But and how do we get fixes then? Does IBM fix it? Or no. 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 no, IBM doesn't do OS2, at least not for anybody that you know. No, but I mean there <laughs> have been a couple of fixes for JFS over well, the years. Well, ask Stephen. Well, we have creative people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, layout. Just like all the PC things, there's, there's a boot record, there is a super block with a copy of the, the uh, super block for redundancy. And then there are some, some inode areas. And the inode is much like an HPFS file node, so it has the basic information about the file. Uh, and then there, at the end there's some, some stuff for logging. So that it's a journaling file system, so it has a log area. And there's some workspace for uh, disk checking, file check area. That's where you can see it has a Unix or Linux heritage. Okay, the extended file systems for Linux. The original, I think there was an extended file system called EXT, but it fairly quickly became EXT2, which was an enhanced version. Uh, and later EXT3, which added journaling, so it became a journaling file system. And then EXT4, which is the most widely used at the moment, uh, which added a lot of other features like uh, larger files and more attributes and whatever. Uh, but they're mostly, uh, they're pretty similar, let's put it that way. Just being added up on, uh, with new features, new structures over time. Just like uh, anything on Unix, Linux, directories are just ordinary files. Um, one difference between this and, and most other files, uh, most other PC file systems is that more directory entries can point to the same file contents actually, so there can be multiple inodes pointing to the same data, called hard links. You also got soft links, which is a little bit similar in functionality, but works differently, it's just, just pointing one inode to uh, the inode for the actual file. But those are all technical details, not 
that important to the most end users. Volume layout, again, boot record, which is uh, often empty if it's a real Linux file system because uh, Linux doesn't use uh, the boot record for anything, uh, it only uses super blocks. Uh, but if it's a bootable volume, then maybe uh, Grub boot code or Lillo or whatever you had for could be in those first uh, sectors. And then the rest of the volumes in EXT are divided up in uh, block groups, and each block group has its own area for inodes uh, and for data and for bitmaps and stuff like that. So on, a, on a large hard disk, you'll probably find hundreds of. Uh, of those uh, block groups. Okay, riser. Uh, that was an interesting development. A couple of years back, it was uh, technically very nice. A V3-based system looks a little bit like the V3FS that's currently uh, doing very well on Linux. Uh, unfortunately, the development of riser at some point stopped because Hans Riser, which was a developer. Ended up in jail. <laughs> I was wasn't able to continue development. So. <laughs> there was a kind of database system, just like NTFS, but based on B trees all all over. I don't have full support for the riser file system, but it's recognized, and you can look at the allocation stuff like that. But it doesn't allow things like browsing or. Okay, questions <coughs> on this. Otherwise, we'll just continue to uh, DFC <coughs> itself. Can I ask you just one question? Um, like, if you ever wanted to play around with this, you can just open the drive as a device, and then you can start to explore around and read it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I use it. Well, you open the drive, and, and and then if you've got a particular file system, most of the file systems will be at least be recognized by DFC. Then you open the partition, and it will probably switch to the right analysis mode for that. Mm -hmm and have the commands available for that file system. I'll show some of that later. Yeah, and you didn't mention XFS. <coughs> I've got a server yeah. that uses that. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. does that fit in? Well, it's just another file system, but it's one that I haven't uh, went into in great detail yet. So I think it is being recognized as being XFS, but not more than that. Okay. So we still need to dig into that. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a complicated one. There, there are a few others out there, like uh, B3FS, better, better FS, I think they call it. Uh, and there's uh, uh, ZFS, <coughs> it's another large one, but, it, but that's sort of a distributed one, uh, which, well, won't get into much detail there. But there, there are more file systems out there, but uh, integrating a, a file system like that into DFC takes me something like a year, year and a half. Because I have to dig into it really deeply and have it available locally, install it, get used to it, and, and find info on the internet, <coughs> and then do the actual coding. <laughs> and also, you never know how long it's going to be useful. Exactly. Like, like Riser FS. Riser is, is, is it, it's, it's, it's in there, there but yeah, yeah. yeah, hardly anyone uses it anymore, I think, <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. But XFS is definitely one of the ones in consideration to be added. Okay, then, DFC concepts, basically. We'll go over that rather quickly as well, and then go over to the new features in DFC. But just uh, for a background, maybe I should have started with this yesterday, <laughs> uh, what the DFC program is and, and where to use it for. Oh, I'll skip over that. A little bit about DFC architecture. I've seen that a few times. Okay, so what's DFC? Well, it's first of all, it's uh, operating system neutral in, in its design, so it's not specifically designed for OS2, not specifically for Windows either. So it tries to be generic, so it, it's fairly easy to port it to a new operating system. And it has functionality much like uh, partitioning tools, like uh, just a plain F disk or LVM in OS2, like Partition Magic, uh, PowerQuest, uh, Drive Image, Norton Ghost, tools like that. <coughs> uh, but also, in, in some ways, it goes further, especially in, in the latest versions, because it's also able to uh, 
actually go into a file system and present it in, in a file manager kind of way. So you're actually looking at the file data uh, as a directory view, and you can look at file contents, you can copy files elsewhere, <coughs> all without using any operating system specific file system driver. So it only looks at the raw data at the disk. You don't need anything else. So you can use the DOS version to, uh, to copy files from an NTFS volume or from an EXT volume, or you can use the OS2 version to go into EXT or into NTFS, whatever. Which is very handy to, to recover files from things that have become unreachable for whatever reason. Maybe because you got a volume that's not being mounted anymore by Windows. It's, it's called a raw file system. It sometimes happens because some of the metadata has been damaged. Well, usually DFC still sees everything correctly, so you can just copy out your most important files and then see if you can recover the rest. <laughs> but at least make sure you got the valuables uh, covered. Um, so its main areas of functionality are, are backup and restore for, for the partitioning information, so not for the actual data uh, in, in this uh, sense. Uh, but it's very easy in DFC to, to just copy all the partitioning information to a relatively small file and at a later point restore those. So if something messes it up and you know that the actual partitioning hasn't changed really, then you can just restore that partitioning backup and you'll be back in business. It often happens when people install Linux, for instance, on, uh, on their existing systems, so things get messed up. Um, you can also, if there is a problem with your partitioning, like uh, boot sectors have been overwritten or whatever, so the partitioning is, has become invisible, and your disk probably looks like empty to almost anything. You can go search for missing partitions, so what it will do is DOC will scan the whole disk and see if it recognizes any MBR or EBR records or boot records, whatever, and make a large list of those. And with some intelligence and knowledge about partitioning, you can then create uh, a script or, or do manual commands to recreate those partitions and usually uh, keep all the data because, uh, well, usually when, when partitioning stuff is missing, the actual data will still be there and still be accessible uh, once the partitioning info has been restored. And then, of course, you can use it as a regular FDISC or LVM type of program to create and manage partitions, view them, create them, delete them, move, copy, stuff like that. You can also use imaging, meaning you can uh, write the contents of partitions or the whole disks or small areas to image files, either raw image files, <coughs> just sectors, or compressed image files. You can restore those to the same spot or to, to a different partition, maybe. So you can use it to transfer data from one partition to the other, uh, while keeping the same size. So there's no file system resizing being done at that point. You can, you can use it to, uh, to move stuff from one place to the other, or one computer to the other. Uh, cloning is similar, except that it doesn't use an intermediate file, it just uh, copies sectors from one partition to another, or from one disk to another, disk to disk cloning, which is what you would do if you, for instance, uh, put a larger disk in your laptop, you just uh, attach the, the new drive over USB or something, and then you make a clone of the internal one, then swap them around and uh, work with the larger drive. After making some more uh, Changes probably uh, if you're using OS2 because you'll have to update the LVM information so that it really knows that the disk is larger. Otherwise, you're still stuck with the old size. Uh, then there are a lot of uh, file system specific things like checking, uh, displaying, uh, undelete files for some file systems, fix uh, minor issues. Uh, one thing to note is that the check that's in there. It, it looks a little bit like check this, but it's not fixing anything, it's just reporting, so it's just analyzing. There are a few fixes in there for some file systems, but uh, to really fix up problems, in, in most cases you'll have to use the check this that has been designed and developed for the file system by OS2, Windows, or whatever. Okay, then there's new functionality, well new, uh, three or four years old, probably by now. Uh, and that is to actually browse your uh, file system data 
uh, <coughs> in a way that looks a lot like a file manager. So it will present it as directories and files, and it has a context menu where you can, can view the data or you can copy the file elsewhere for recovery purposes. Um, and you can also access file systems not not only directly from a disk or from, <coughs> from a volume, but also from uh, uh, images. So if you create a, a compressed image file for a complete disk, for instance, using DFC, you can open that image using DFC and actually go into it, go into the partitions, go into uh, the file system using the browser and copy a file out of it. So you can use it as a selective restore for a single file uh, that you have kept in, in, in uh, an image backup. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the real low-level stuff, you can uh, look at stuff in binary or hex. Uh, there's, a, there's a fairly uh, extensive uh, hex editor in there that you can uh, use, which also uh, supports uh, assembly, disassembly format, and ASCII format. So if you look at certain files that contain a lot of ASCII stuff, you can filter that out and just look at the ASCII stuff. Or, or you can look at the, uh, if it's an executable, you can look at the actual code in a disassembly format. Then if you look at it technically, how does DFC work? Well, uh, in essence it's very simple. Uh, DFC just looks at collections of sectors and just a linear array of sectors. And each of those uh, it's called a store, So, and it has multiple stores available actually two at the user level, so there's store A and store B, for instance. Uh, most often you'll only work with one, and most users are not even aware of the existence of stores. Uh, but sometimes it's uh, good to know that they are there. Uh, operations like cloning, for instance, use two stores. You attach one store to one disk, and the other store to the destination disk, and then you say clone, and it will just clone between those two store areas. Uh, and also you can, using the command line in DFC, you can look up the details about what the store is doing, what's attached to it, uh, how many reads and writes have been done to it, and stuff like that. And things like geometry, it's all low-level detail about the open object, <coughs> it's a disk, a partition, or a volume, or whatever. Okay, if there are any questions, just shout. Across different disk types, NVMe from a IDE drive or well, a CD. As long as the size is matched, it doesn't really matter what the underlying technology is. Uh, DFC just opens it using whatever it knows how to open that kind of disks, and from there on, it's just a collection of sectors. So for DFC, it doesn't matter. Uh, as said, as long as the size is matched, if you're cloning, uh, of course the destination disk should be at least the same size as the original. Otherwise you'll lose something. Uh, but yeah, normally that would be possible. What I, do, what I often do is uh, clone internal disk to something external, like a USB attached disk, and then later swap them or something, or whatever. Or clone between two USB attached disks. Can you clone to a larger size disk. Mm -hmm. no, that's no problem. Okay. That's no problem, but there will be uh, an empty space at the uh -huh. end, of course. Uh -huh. And then uh, one, one tricky thing about OS2 and LVM is that the, the size of the disk is actually recorded in all those LVM sectors that we mentioned yesterday, <coughs> the DLAT. It, it has a disk geometry and a disk size recorded in there. So you'll have to update that or otherwise OS2 and the LVM utility in OS2 and, and the uh, the derived utilities that Alex made, that are also LVM type utilities, will not see the new size. Okay. But there's there's menu functions in DFC to actually update that. So it will see the new size and write it to all those LVM information you sectors. Added automatic geometry size conversion to the cloning yet, Automatic? Geometry size. In other words, you go from a 512 to a 1 terabyte, your geometry is going to change at the lower level. Clone, that's not going to be right anymore. No, cloning will keep the exact uh, geometry as it was in the source, and, and usually the operating system will pick that up correctly if it if it mounts that disk or sees that disk. 
So it's usually not a problem. But well, it's uh, actually at the partition level, though, or the volume level, where the geometry is stored, too. Uh, I'm not sure where you're getting at, but... Yeah. Well, think about it. We've got sectors per track, right? Mm -hmm. And that is used to locate where the uh, LVM information is. Yeah. And if your sectors per track is different at the MDR level, or at the DVI level, yeah, well, at the low level, then you're going to have trouble planning. You may have, but uh, in, in practice, uh, the problem is not that large. Usually, uh, when booting, it, after you have cloned something in some kind of geometry, uh, it will still be picked up correctly because it, it sees yeah. what what the geometry is in the MBR and it will pick it up correctly. But there are some some quirks there. Yeah, yeah it's sort of like unknown which clone, which geometry it's going to mm -hmm. use a lot of time. And, it, and it gets it gets more complicated if you got uh, I was still with Linux and Windows on the same system because they all look at it slightly different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the versions that are available, it's available for five platforms at the moment, OS2, which is also my main development platform, so it's usually the best, the best tested version as well. Um, there's a DOS version that uh, used to be available on diskette images, but these days mostly on USB sticks or, or the bootable CD-ROM. Uh, there's a Windows version that works used to work from the very early NT versions, but because of all API changes and stuff, I've now restricted it to Windows XP as the latest version that still works. Uh, works up to Windows 10, and actually the Windows 10 version works best so far because it does uh, resizing of the window and stuff a lot better. It does notification, so actually on, on Windows 10 you can, you can grab the DFC window and make it larger, and it will repaint automatically, and, and so works very nice, just like it used to do already on Mac OS and Linux. <laughs> uh, OS2 is, is a little bit more rigid in that sense, so you have to use the mode command to set a window size, and you cannot do it dynamically. Um, there's a, a fairly good Linux version, uh, which is by the way written in a way that it has almost no dependencies on anything on Linux. It only accesses the kernel functions. So it doesn't use any of the Linux dynamic libraries, which is why it will probably work on most Linux distributions. And you don't have much version problems. The disadvantage is that I cannot use any of, of that functionality that's in all those Linux libraries. So everything in DFC, including mouse support, and it's, is all written uh, from, from the kernel level. Uh, and there's also a port for macOS, which is basically just another Unix. It's a BSD style, so it, it, it's not at the macOS graphical level. It's, it's uh, it runs in the terminal, um, and it should be fairly easy to port it to other BSDs or to other uh, Unix like AAX. Uh, the only thing uh, things I have to change are, are some things in in the terminal addressing probably and, and maybe uh, the way uh, how to find uh, the actual disks the, the, the device names will be different but 99% uh, of the coding should be uh, exactly the same and if you look at the uh, DFC code it, it's fairly large it's something together with the, the user interface library it's probably something like 400 source files uh, many megabytes uh, and of all that code, I think about 95 to 98% is generic, and the rest is platform-specific. So small chunks of code that address specific things for a platform, like disk accessing, or like terminal handling, uh, things like that. OK, already mentioned this. All storage is seen as a collection of uh, sectors. This is some kind of overview that tells you a little bit. thing in the middle is DFC, the guts, and the functionality it offers. And the things around <coughs> it, on top you'll see the supported analysis modes, the file systems basically. So there's NTFS, FAT, JFS, the things we already mentioned. The blue ones left and right are 
file I/O stuff. That you can use scripts for DFC because DFC internally is, is command driven. Uh, almost everything is done by using a command with parameters, uh, and you can either type those in directly on the command line or you can generate the commands more or less automatically by using the menu system, which which has a which is a lot easier to use, but Underneath it will uh, create a command for you to do the work. Uh, but you can also put those commands into scripts uh, using a, uh, a language, uh, a structured language that includes uh, if statements and while statements. So you can you can do fairly uh, uh, complicated stuff that way. Um, and you can also have uh, uh, you can write image files, you can uh, read image files and restore them to disks or, or create them from this. Uh, then there's logging and trace, so everything you do in DFC can be logged to a file. Uh, so everything you see on the screen will be available later on. Uh, and there will be analysis result files, like there's the DFS disk procedure or DFS fast, which will do an analysis of the disk and the partitioning, create uh, human readable files and also some binary files uh, which you can actually use in DFC later to uh, create what I call a virtual <coughs> disk in DFC that looks very much like your original disk um, uh, that I can use at home to analyze your problems without having your disk physically present. Well, it's almost the same. Thing, but this, this is how DFC looks at, uh, at anything, so whether it's a real disk or a virtual disk or a volume or some raw data or whatever. Uh, simply attach a store object to, to one, of those, uh, one of those inputs and uh, work from there. Well, I'm into those details already mentioned both of that. Okay, the virtual disks are rather important for me as, a, as a to do support on, on data recovery things uh, because just as I said, uh, I can instruct uh, an end user to create uh, an analysis report and I can actually import such a report <coughs> and the associated files into DFC uh, and it will create uh, more or less the, the, the whole disk without the actual disk content, so there will be no use data in there, but it will have all the partitioning information uh, and, and some info from the start of the disk, so I, I can usually, I can figure out 99% uh, of the problems using just that. And it's also very useful uh, if you want to play a little bit with DFC, uh, because it's virtual. Uh, you can actually start DFC using a parameter like uh, minus die minus, I think it's called, yeah. Which means uh, do not load any of the actual physical disk on your system. Uh, start empty and then you create a virtual disk and start playing. That way you won't risk damaging anything real on your system. Only the virtual stuff in memory. So. Okay, questions on that? Did you? I, I, did I understand that you kind of open uh, essentially a virtual PC disk image? Yeah. And work, work with that. Well, that not a virtual a virtual box. Virtual box. Okay. CDI. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, there there are several formats out there for for various uh, uh, virtual machines. And yeah. Uh, I've only implemented the VDI so far because that's what I use. Okay. Uh, but there is conversion programs for. There are conversion programs. Virtual PC yeah, to but, that. But it's probably easier. If because these things tend to, t tend to be large, so, yeah. so uh, it, it would be easier if, if I could access them directly. Yeah. And that will probably happen over time, but, well, it's one of those things, you know, time. You know, sure, uh, sure. Limited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we expect that next week? <laughs> no, no, maybe the week after. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a question. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on the, the standard mode versus the expert mode option? Uh, yeah, they'll, they'll be in the next presentation. The next so at least they'll be mentioned. So if you've got a specific question, ask again then. Because, yeah, that they're, they're part of the new features in the last couple of versions. Let me see where one is. Oh.
So this is the only presentation that got some actual changes uh, this year. <laughs> this is version 16 there, which was released uh, late last year, I think, or early this year. I'm not sure. Uh, it shows the fake memory stick that never existed. I just took that from the internet and put my sticker on there. <laughs> but the other one's an actual photo of a real uh, memory stick being sold on the, in the Mensis uh, web shop. And there's also a newer version of that, which I got a few of them here as well. The, the white stick is a 16 gigabyte, so it has some space for log files and, and small images. Uh, I got a newer version of that, that also has the very latest version on it, 16.5. Uh, this is a 64 gigabyte stick, so it has a lot more room to, to store images of uh, your OS2 boot partitions or whatever, log files and whatnot. Uh, I have about a dozen of them available if you want one, uh, they're 30 Thirty dollars each. I'll have them uh, around. Does that include the license? No, that does not include the license. There's, there's a, a temporary license on there, so it will work. It's functional. Uh, we'll have to copy your own license to the root directory of the stick, and then it will pick that up. Okay, let's continue with that. So it will. Uh, I'll tell a little bit more about uh, DFC functional, uh, what it does. There's some repetition of that uh, <laughs> with the previous presentation. Uh, but then I'll, I'll go into detail uh, of some of the new functions being added in, in the last couple of versions since 2010 or so, starting at version 9, which was a, a release that had a, a lot of new stuff in it. Skip over that. Okay, how do we see that? Same slide. This is also the same information we saw before, except that it, it mentions the menu specifically. That's what you'd use if you got into problems usually. Analyze disk for support. It will generate, uh, for each disk, it will generate something like five or six files. And if you send those to me, I'll probably be able to help you. <coughs> Maintaining partitions using the menu system, create, delete, just like uh, many other FDIS programs. It also has a specific partition table editor, which is a lower level thing that looks at the partition table entries specifically. And you can edit and update each field. So it's, it's you can easily manipulate flags or, or values, labels, stuff like that. Uh, and stuff like that, yeah. Okay, imaging, also mentioned that. That's what you do when you take a bunch of sectors to put them in a file, a raw file or a compressed file, mm -hmm. for later uh, restoring to the same area or somewhere else. Cloning, similar but just directly from one disk to another or one partition to another. And there are some special options in there as well for handling uh, damaged disks. What it will do then is uh, you can specify, okay, as soon as you hit a bad sector, just skip over 10 megabytes and continue to, to make the whole process faster. So you'll lose those 10 megabytes, but you won't be spending half a day waiting for bad sector retry stuff like that. So there's some stuff in the cloning that makes it easier to use. And there's also smart technology uh, that's both in, in cloning and in imaging. The smart technology means that DFC will actually skip over sectors and clusters that it knows by using <coughs> tables and using allocation information from the file system that it knows that are empty. And uh, that works 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, I do know there are some quirks, like if, you, if you're cloning or copying uh, a bootable ext4, it seems that in some cases it will not be bootable if you use the smart technology. So there's something there probably that I'm missing. Uh, so if you do that and it's critical, uh, turn off the smart option. So if it fails the first time, try it again without the smart option and it may work. <coughs> but uh, doing this, uh, especially if the disks are nearly empty, uh, this will make it 10, 10 or 100 times faster than copying every empty sector as well. 
vow recovery. Underlead. Well, underlead. <coughs> in some cases, an HP vessel fat, you can do something, but um, usually it's file recovery, so you, you know that the information is there in the file system, but you cannot get to it in a normal way. It's not mounted for some reason in Linux, or it's, it's not recognized by OS2. There's, there's a problem. Check this, cannot <coughs> fix it, maybe. One of the things in, in the latest JFS drivers that you sometimes end up with a problem that uh, check this, cannot fix. So cannot read M from whatever. Is one of the messages <laughs> when it's kind of read the metadata. Uh, usually, you can still get in with DFC, then you use the browser. Yes. Question: I guess if you're inside of a Arc OS uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you're running it, mm -hmm. can you run DFC and set how much manipula manipulation can you do? Or are you limited there if you're already inside uh, your? So you got you got Arc OS booted. Yes. And you start the OS2 version of DFC. Okay. Th that's what and you mean. And inside, then yes. Can you do any manipulation there, or you're limited to you what you can do? Well, you can, but but if the op if the file system is mounted and, yes. and being managed by the file system driver, uh, there will be some changes. So if you look at it, some things might look inconsistent. So normally, if the file system has been closed down properly, so the system is shut down, and you boot from something else, and you look at the file system, everything should be stable. There should be no errors, stuff okay. like that. But if you look at a live file system on your booted system, and you ask DFC to do a check, it will probably report several problems that are not real problems because uh, it, it's all in flux. It's still, <laughs> it's still being maintained and it's not 100% consistent on the disk yet. So yeah, there's that. Yeah. So one of the things uh, that often works but is not really supported is if you actually copy or clone uh, the partition you're booted from. What will happen is it will make a copy of whatever is on the disk at that point in time and it will be more or less consistent but not 100%. And it's very similar if you later try to boot from that copy, which is, is almost correct but not quite, uh, it will be very similar to booting a system that has been just powered down. So it will usually work but not always. That's why I recommend to always boot from something else like, like a memory stick because then the, the file systems are supposed to be stable and, and consistent. Okay, so most of this stuff, the file recovery, uh, it, it's been there for years and years, but it was pretty hard to use because uh, it involved manual commands for searching stuff and then listing it and selecting and whatever uh, possible, but not very user-friendly. Uh, but since a couple of years, I got the browser user interface, which looks, like, looks much like a file manager. And it has context menu for copy files and stuff like that, so it makes it a lot easier. I actually use it myself now a lot. Uh, it tells you something. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> okay, some more details on that. If you're in the browser, you can view in ASCII, disassembly, hex edit, you can modify stuff. Uh, you can view some metadata because the, the, the browser knows about metadata for the file so you can look at things like the MFT records, you can look at the I notes or the F notes that are associated with the files. Uh, and you can open the hex editor directly on them so you could modify stuff if you know what you know what you're doing. Um, you can look at the extended attributes if it's always to you can edit file names in some stuff that like on HPFS or JFS, you sometimes have a code page problem where you cannot delete a file using the regular stuff that you can use the browser to go to that spot and just rename the file. And it will, it knows that it needs to update both the uh, I node or F node and also the directory information because file names are often duplicated inside a file system. Um, there's a restriction there that the length has to stay the same. That's because otherwise I'd have to rearrange a lot of stuff and uh, this makes it easier. And also when changing names you probably have to take care that you don't change the, the leading part of the name because that's used in the uh, sorting of the directory stuff. It's or usually organized in B trees and if you change the name, name completely, like, like changing the first letter, it will mess up the sorting order and the directory searching will fail, so it will probably lose whole directory trees by doing that. <coughs> so be aware. Uh, I think it gives a warning for that when doing it. Interactive editing. 
also possible using the hex editor, disassembly, mouse marking. The user interface has improved a lot in that area lately. It, uh, it supports the mouse on all platforms now, and it also supports the clipboard when, when possible. So you can actually just uh, mark an area in the hex editor and copy it to a text file or something for documentation purposes or whatever. Uh, it's fairly easy to use. I'll probably show some of that later. The native scription, uh, script thing has been announced. In the beginning it was just a list of commands to be executed, linear list. Uh, but I've enhanced it at some point to include uh, uh, constructs like uh, looping and, and conditional branching, stuff like that. Uh, it, it looks a little bit like Rex in some areas, it looks a little bit like Perl in others, and uh, so it's just another one of those C-like languages. Uh, I've been looking at using something standard, but it was fairly difficult to get that for all five platforms in, in a consistent way, so that's why I built it ground up, basically. So it's all my own code now, which makes it easier to port. I think we went over that already. Yeah. Uh, I restricted the Mac OS version to a 64-bit version now only, because well, partly because I could only build the 32-bit version on another old iMac that I had. The newer stuff uh, didn't correctly create the old 32-bit versions anymore because the, the compilers and all the stuff uh, are being maintained by Apple uh, and they're actively trying to push away the 30-bit stuff too. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> and actually the um, all the Apple hardware that has been out there the last 10 years or so is 64-bit capable so it <coughs> and the next the next major Mac OS version will be 64-bit only. So no need to maintain the 32-bit for Mac OS. Uh, all the others are 32-bit and it'll probably <coughs> stay that way. Well, that's so just... Then, yeah. Cause if you were talking, I, I don't know, some years ago that you were checking QT maybe to me. So mm -hmm. <coughs> QT. Uh, are you working yeah. on that? Or? Uh, not actively working yet, but I'm monitoring the, the progress that they're making and I'm actually waiting for QT5 to be usable enough. Uh, because I don't want to start something uh, that is not uh, supported very well by the other platforms. Because it's pretty hard to, to develop for QT4 now if you're using macOS or Windows, because that's all obsolete, more or less. Uh, so I'm waiting for the OS2 version of QT5 to be there. And what I plan most likely will be sort of a QT wrapper around the DFC low-level functionality, so that the whole user interface and stuff like that will be graphical. QT based. And you have a Windows, Linux, Windows, Mac Linux, uh, OS2, and Mac. There won't be a DOS version for. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but I'll. Um, I will maintain the text version as well. Yeah. Uh, because it's it's somewhat useful in in uh, certain areas. And maybe the the QT one will be limited at first by just uh, partitioning functions and and uh, browsing perhaps, so that the most used functions, and then add functionality over time. Also try to keep it simple, the user interface will work. Most people are more accustomed to graphical user interface anyway, but I, I shouldn't put too much uh, stuff in there, I think, <coughs> because it will get too complicated quickly. <laughs> okay. Uh, as mentioned before, I think I started on, on the on the base thing in 1994, and then somewhere in 2001, 2002, I started actively developing it in as uh, in my own company. And actually, before that, before version four, it was a uh, public domain. At, at the start, it was uh, IBM internal. I think I published it internally within IBM for for use for other people that, that were working on OS2 and HPFS. Uh, but later on, it, it went onto the internet and uh, as a public domain stuff, and version four became the first version that you could buy a regi registration for. Okay, then version nine brought uh, some things about uh, content-based geometry because, uh, well, 
geometry is a, is a very strange thing in discs. And it's not really necessary, but it's still there because of uh, heritage of old code and stuff like that. And disc tools being very specific about what geometry to use. Uh, and version 9 added some disc sniffing where it would examine the MBR, examine LVM stuff and, and see what the most likely uh, geometry would be to, to be used on this disc. And the EXT 2, 3 and 4 stuff was added in the riser. Some things about Grub. And this introduced the, uh, the better scripting as well, version 9. And the disassembler. Version 10 added the first bootable USB stick, which was based on Pendrive Linux. That was a small boot uh, thing that uh, could actually boot uh, multiple ISO files. So that's basically what it is. It, it's a bootloader that can uh, uh, boot uh, multiple ISO files that you put on there. And I distribute this thing uh, with the DFC I ISO uh, preloaded, uh, the DOS version. And it also already had the menu to start the Linux version, but you'd have to download that separately because it was rather large. Uh, and some more enhancement in version 10, of course. This is what it looked like if you started it up. It's got the DFC uh, splash screen, and then you could select between FreeDOS to run it or to boot into Linux. Uh, but if you download and create the stick, the Linux one will not be functional because you still have to download the actual Linux stuff separately. Well, this is how you use it. I mentioned that already. It's still being used by a lot of people. Uh, although the later ones that we'll see in a minute uh, are better in many ways. Version 11. Updates to the user interface, JFS, HPFS stuff that was <coughs> because of bootable JFS there were some changes made uh, and it displays that stuff correctly now. Uh, first the GPT support was there, display only, so it could show GPT disk could not manipulate them in any way. And some bad sector handling. Version 12. Version 12 introduced the basic mode, so I, I had a menu and the menu was growing and growing and people couldn't find anything anymore and so uh, <coughs> I decided to introduce a basic menu mode that it starts up in by default which has the most used functionality present and only if you need the more enhanced stuff you can switch to the expert mode and you'll get more stuff. Okay. Uh, then they added some more stuff to the user interface, allowing you to search through the actual text buffer with, with uh, logging, but also through the help files and stuff like that. It has normal linear searching, but it also has things like a grab-like functionality where it will present you with a result list and you can just select the line that looks the most promising to give you the information you want. And some more enhancements to file system support for FAN. Version 13, it had the full support for GPT, so it, uh, it could manipulate those just like it could the NBR partitions. Uh, it has a special, it has a second version, I should say, for the partition table editor. So the old one uh, worked on the NBR style uh, partition uh, records, and this one works <coughs> on the GPT. And there was full, sort f uh, full support for uh, the EXT file systems, including browsing and recovering and whatever. Version 14, more browsing, <coughs> many file systems. Uh, and it was the first version to uh, allow you access to uh, file systems inside images, like uh, TFC's own EMZ files, EMZ, uh, and into VDI images. Version 15, yeah, the user interface is something that's being enhanced continuously. Uh, whenever I see something that uh, this could be easier, then try to implement it to, to make it available over all platforms and, and whatever. More browsing stuff there. Uh, full support for HFS, which was the most used file system on uh, Mac systems until then. Uh, 
uh, probably still is, although the last two versions, two major versions of macOS uh, tend to convert your disk internally to the uh, HPFS file system, which is the Apple file system, uh, which, because HFS basically is something like 20 years old in design. HPFS is much more modern uh, and it implements uh, actually it's a file system a bit like uh, ZFS which uh, you can have one or more disks they, they put them in a pool of a storage pool uh, and then in that storage pool it will create volumes so if you've got multiple volumes in HPFS uh, they're not nicely separated physically on the disk but they're all scattered over the whole <coughs> storage area you have which is usually one disk but it could be more um, and version 15 is the first one to actually implement that. It is a bit tricky if you look at your boot disk in on the, on your MacBook or whatever, because uh, because of all all security stuff, uh, which is being enhanced uh, in every re release in macOS, uh, you actually won't be able to see your boot disk at all, uh, <coughs> even if you're a super user. Uh, you have to switch off parts of the security system using special commands that you can find on the internet somewhere <laughs> to be able to look at your boot disk. But you could still, you could already look directly at HPFS formatted external disk or second disk or whatever. Uh, I usually have those security features disabled on my system so I can look at my boot disk directly. Uh, but HPFS like many other file systems, it uses a lot of caching internally. So if you look at your live disk, your boot disk, there will be so many changes that a lot of things look inconsistent. And actually, if you look at disk with DFC, it will warn you at startup and say, OK, I'm opening this file system, but there have been uh, 3,046 uh, updates since uh, the last update of the cache. So it will know that things are out of whack. Um, it also introduced the DFS Puppy, original uh, Linux Puppy distribution that was uh, customized by me to have uh, DFC on it installed already, uh, including some icons to start it. Uh, and it was also physically available from the Mensis web shop. Uh, and the other way to make them uh, is uh, I create uh, image files from them. Uh, and those are available from my website and there are menu items in DFC to actually create a new stick uh, from DFC itself using the menu. Okay, the final one. 16 was introduced earlier this year, I think. More enhancements to the user interface, more file browsing stuff. Uh, like one of the things you can do now is uh, if you look at Unix file systems, there will be a lot of dot file entries or, or whatever. Uh, hidden directories you can now using a <coughs> an option you can hide those or show them whatever you like makes it more easy to find stuff find user files uh, APFS is now fully supported including file recovery and, and file browsing uh, the ISO file system is supported mm. and there's new version of the DFS puppy ones based on, on the latest uh, Puppy releases. What yes. triggered you to actually add? What triggered you to add the ISO file system support? Just felt like it. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've I've had I've been looking at it in the past uh, already, and I uh, thought, well, you have some ISO files. Sometimes you like to to, to pull a file from sure. it, and, and there are ways to do it by mounting it in Linux or by even mounting it in OS2. OS2 these days, but uh, I thought, well, it can't be that complicated. So yeah, well, actually, well, I think it was just about a month month and a half of work so. okay uh, at the moment uh, for the the puppy sticks there are actually three uh, variations that you can download there's still the original one uh, called divas puppy it is an old uh, slack based linux based puppy uh, of course it has the latest dfc version but, uh, operating system is a little bit older uh, and it's 32-bit it's BIOS only so it will not boot on the UFE uh, system uh, then there's a similar one it's also 
32 bits that has the latest uh, Puppy Linux. And there's a 64-bit one. Uh, and that one has uh, all the code in it to boot from a UEFE system as well. So it will actually boot on this uh, uh, rather new uh, ThinkPad. Which I'll probably show just in a minute. Um, okay, that, that's about it. I think that was the last one. Oh, it still has it has a screenshot. This is the original puppy one. So it's a fully functional Linux desktop. So it will show you the the mounted uh, disk and partitions there. Everything you can actually access those as well from Linux directly. But you can also uh, boot uh, or start BFC from there and do whatever you want. Will it mount like a GFS partition also? Sorry. Will it mount on that Linux desktop like a JFS partition and it become visible or not? Uh, the stick, yeah. It will. The okay. stick itself, yeah. It's there. It, it won't mount HPFS. It's yeah. probably this. Th okay. This stick will not mount HPFS. It will not even mount JFS, I think, and NTFS. Uh, but the next one will. This this okay. is the older so one. Yeah. If you look at this one, this is the newer mm -hmm. one, the 64-bit. Uh, and as you can see, if you look at the, this is the same system they're booted on, but if you look at the number of disks, it only shows uh, three partitions here and the stick, the memory stick, that it's booted from. And the next one shows a lot more, and that's because it has uh, b the built-in support for NTFS and JFS, and it will show my internal partitions. I had quite a, f quite a few JFS ones. So. Uh, to recover stuff, you could just boot the stick and, and use a Linux uh, file manager or whatever to copy files from JFS or whatever. Uh, or start, <coughs> start DFC and use the browser. It's easier. Did you have to build your own kernel to make this work, or are you just able to load modules? Sorry? Did you have to build your own kernel to make this work, or were you just no. able to load the modules? No, that's why I went to the latest puppy version and had it included by default. I'm <laughs> and, and lazy. <laughs> so if you go on your website, we can purchase something that will allow us to create this stick. Yeah. Well, actually, if you got the if you download the latest version, version 16, uh, it will have it in the menu. I'll That's show it later. You, you can also get it right there. Okay. Sorry. You get the thirty dollars back. <laughs> You said it was thirty dollars, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, I didn't say that. I'd give it to you. I said, <laughs> 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 but if I buy it on your website, I have to pay X number of dollars, right? No. Well, if you if you buy one in the web shop, I will send it to you physically. Uh -huh. But if you just download the image, it's free. Oh. But it and doesn't come with a license, the, so you'll have to buy the license anyway. License. Yeah. If, yeah, yeah, but then you have to and you have to buy a license also. Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. But you already have that. Okay. Well, that doesn't the $30 include the license? Or no. Is that the no. Price? <laughs> 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 That's the $45. Uh, $30 is just, uh, it's just a few dollars more than the actual price of yeah, the uh, device, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay, then let's look. We don't have that much time. Well, let's look at the uh, actual DFC. Anything specific you'd like to see? This is the Windows 10 version. I've, I've made the font a little bit larger so you can actually read it. It's 16.6, just a couple of days old, because I was visiting uh, one of my customers here in Florida, Felix Miata, and he had a problem with a large 3 terabyte disk that uh, I was able to solve. So there's a few fixes in there. Um, got exactly the same version. Running in a virtual box on ArcOS here. It's also 16.6. So you can see it's running on the OS2 kernel, 14200 SMP. Let's see, let's get back to... Oh. Some of the things I mentioned, the user interface, you can do, you can use a clipboard for instance, if you just use Ctrl C for copy actually copy the, the text of this message to the uh, clipboard so you can now go to a text thing and you got your version information there. You can do that the same in, in, in pop-up messages with errors or something, it will just copy the text out. Uh, 
but you can also. Uh, I don't need my glasses for that. You should be able to use the mouse as well. And say, okay, well, I want this, this part. And then you say Control C, and it should say, just copy the marked area now. And you can do this uh, stuff like that in, 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 in here as well. Just copy something. Uh, you can also paste back into the command line, for instance, so you can get a command from uh, a log file and it just paste it back into a command line. So it, it's fairly uh, complete, the support, on most platforms. Uh, it even works in DOS. Uh, although in DOS, uh, the, the clipboard is, is a TFC internal because there's no concept of a clipboard in DOS. So it's just to copy stuff from the log <coughs> file or from your output to the command line. <coughs> Um, <laughs> is there anything specific someone would like to see that I can show here? Otherwise, I'll just boot one of my sticks and show you the Linux version. Yeah. Uh, I have two, one question yeah. and one suggestion. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about the matter of the error messages for the boundary discrepancies. So could you tell us when that's really something we need to think about and when it's just a formal warning, a formality? The second thing is there's some infelicity about the log. So it's a nice about what? feature, the log. Oh, the log file, yeah. Yeah, but as I understand, at least in the version I had, mm -hmm. when I, which I was using, mm -hmm. the log file is created in the virtual memory. And so sometimes when I shut a system down, I lose the log. Mm -hmm. So, but when I have enough well, coffee, I have to drop to the command line and copy it over to a different name on the USB stick. Wouldn't it be better to mirror the image in both places or save it on the USB stick? Then you wouldn't lose it in the virtual memory when you shut down the machine. Ah, uh, that, that's because you're using the older USB stick. That's the, the, the DOS based one. You, you, you can better use the, the, the puppy ones. They're okay, so you mean one? Because I can boot in two ways from the stick. I can boot to the DOS version. Or no, I can no, no, let's get back to let back to basic. The old stick you have is it's a it's a universal loader that can boot other ISO images. And there's one ISO image that's preloaded, that's a DOS version that yeah. you've been using, and that has a bit of a problem because it's it's doing everything in a RAM disk. So it, if if you crash halfway, you lose everything. Yes. There's another possibility on that one to use Linux, that's a it's called not sure what the name was, whatever. Uh, an yeah, that's the one I'm using more recently. So where does it save the log file? It saves it on the stick or it saves it in the virtual no. memory? That one doesn't save it on the stick either. That's why we have to use the newer stuff, the puppy, DFS puppy sticks. Those, those have uh, much better integration and they will write their log files onto the stick. Onto the stick, okay. So basically yeah. it's just that I have an old version. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That, that's, yeah, that's but, but tell us about the formality of the warning <laughs> of the, uh, the sectors don't line up, the boundaries don't line up. Yeah, uh, CSS issues or alignment issues, that's your question. Yes, so but when is it, but I think I asked you once about it and you said... Yeah, oh, you, you want to know when is it critical and when it's not, well, the answer is easy. It depends. It says if it was if it was if it was very easy to explain, it would probably be on the screen already. You would say error if you really knew it was an error. Yeah, yeah. If it says error, it's usually more uh, more serious than if I say it's a warning. So okay, so if it's an error, we have to read the documentation, which doesn't exist yet. Yeah, or write me an email or whatever. It, it, it very often it's not very critical, but it's something that I'd say, okay, I should mention this because it might be a problem in some circumstances. Yeah. So, for example, if it's the operating system, so I have multiple OSs on my computer, so mm -hmm. what it might mean then that something which gives you a warning, mm -hmm. the partition or some files would not be visible when I boot to another OS. Is that Possi right? Possibly, yeah, that's one okay. of the possibilities. Okay. But very often, uh, most of the operating systems are rather flexible, so they'll usually work and just you won't see any real problems. But DFC at the lower level sees, okay, it's, it's not 100% consistent, but it will probably work. So and are there ways to fix these things? Not if, not if you don't see any other problems. Mm -hmm. it, don't go fixing it just because DFC gives a warning. Because you break something else. You might, yeah. <laughs> 
Okay then, um, if there are no more questions on this, Adam, I could show a lot more things, but yeah. Well, I do have one more question. So on Arca OS, yeah. if can I, I, I can both, can I recover an EFAT, you know, deal? EXFAT, yeah. EX, well, yeah. I'm going EFAT, you know. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very much like it, though. Yeah, very much like it. Very much can like I, it, yeah. Can I recover it to another EFAT? No. Uh, no. No, if you, uh, yeah, good point. Um, if you're recovering files, if you're using the file browser, uh, you can access all the file systems that DFC knows about and knows how to get files from, but you can only write to, to file systems that the operating system knows about and knows how to write. So on OS2, you can only write to HPFS, <coughs> FAT, or JFS. And on Windows, you can only write to FAT and NTFS. And on Linux, you can only write to EXT or whatever Linux knows about. Yeah, good point. Um, okay, then. Let's so shoot down. This the DOS version, you're recovering files from another, another file system that has files bigger than what FAT can handle. You can't, you can't actually recover the files. It's going to be FAT. Mm -hmm. about that. That's fine on using the DOS version. So I, like to, I like to use the DOS for that kind of stuff. Let's see if I can properly shut down this thing. I'm not sure why it has scroll bars, but it has. But if the DOS version, if you have like NTFS Pro or something installed in DOS, where it can write to NTFS. Yeah, you could if you, have, if you have drivers installed, but they're usually flaky, so. Okay, shut down the virtual machine. Now let's shut down the actual Windows. Copy and pasting functions will work in the hex editor too. Uh, the copy and pasting functions will work in the hex editor too. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you can actually mark stuff in the hex area or in the ASCII area, and, and it will pick up okay. either either one. So if you got the if you the cursor on the hex part, it will copy the the, the hex parts. If you got it in the ASCII part, it will copy that. It's fairly flexible. Okay, <coughs> let's see if uh, this works today. It should, because I tested it yesterday in the evening. <laughs> the only issue I've run into with the DFS puppy one. Sorry? The only issue I've run into with the DFS puppy one is the fact that I'm used to double clicking, so I keep ending up with two FDFCs. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the Linuxes ah. now do do double click as default, yeah. but yeah, they used to yeah. always be always single click. Yeah. yeah. That used to be the first thing I would change when I first started using Linux. Yeah. Oh. Drove me nuts always opening things by accident. Yeah. The one I'm booting now has been slightly modified yesterday evening to support the resolution of the projector. Because the standard sticks would go into high resolution and it would, for some reason, it would uh, distribute my uh, image over, over this screen and that one just stretch it out. Oh, yeah. So now it's booting uh, Puppy Linux, which is uh, basically the stick is a, a FAT32 file system and it just has a few special files like drop booting uh, and it has the whole Puppy Linux in a few large image files and there's one custom file which has DFC in the name somewhere and that's internally is, is an image file with an uh, ext4 file system and it has all the changes that I made to the system that deal with DFC. So all the DFC icons that are there and, and the DFC program are all contained in that single image file. So that, that's the one I really maintain at home. Uh, but I put it out as a single DFC image and it's fairly easy to, uh, to create a stick from that. Uh, if you boot this, well you see the, the other disk here in my uh, system, NVMe something because this uh, uh, laptop has an NVMe uh, SSD internally and what's on this system uh, it's a GPT system Windows 10 and it also has a Linux version installed uh, natively uh, that also uses GPT and if you boot this uh, you got a few uh, things that are DFC specific like a, uh, of course uh, oh the mouse doesn't work I need a USB mouse from someone if possible <laughs> yeah I can use the, the track point as well but it's then I get problems with my uh, 
track point. Sorry? Is that a Bluetooth mouse or something? No, no, it's just the USB mouse. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's it, his, one, his one that isn't working now. Oh. Oh, oh yeah. this is this Bluetooth, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, and mm, I might be able to enable Bluetooth in, in this thing, but I haven't found it yet. Okay, you can just run DFC here. And as you can see, the sticks come with uh, temporary keys. It's still quite a few days left. Uh, actually, after it expires, it will still work, but it will bug you a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, but the idea is that you put your own registration key on there. So this is uh, basically the disk we're looking at. Um, the internal disk, the SSD, and this is the stick where we're looking at the bionic bug. And the, uh, the other one has a uh, GPT partitioning with an EFI system partition. It has the Windows partition that's normally booted. <coughs> it has some Linux uh, stuff on there. Uh, it has an extended FAT, so EXFAT here, where I put my uh, virtual box VMs stuff in there. Uh, and I made that EXFAT because then I can <coughs> use them both from Windows and from Linux. I can use the same uh, VMs. Uh, and you can actually go into there. You should be able to go into there. Um, okay, this another thing to mention, if you look at the menu now, it's fairly easy. It's in the uh, basic menu, as you can see by the, the B that's on, on, the, on the right hand. You can actually switch to export here in the menu, but you can also just go to that B and click on it, and it will go to export. Um, so what I could do now is, uh, for instance, uh, browse something, the partition, and now I can select that uh, uh, EFAT one, it should work, so now it's, it has those subdirectories on them, and I can go into those, you see there are log files in there, you can actually look at one of those, the context menu, you can view stuff, copy stuff, you can copy the file, so if you do this it will <coughs> present you with a, a file save dialog so you can now say okay I want to save it somewhere else. Or you can just look at the data. By default it will go to the ASCII mode because there's a lot of ASCII in it, it will scan the file a little bit and if there's a lot of ASCII it will start in, in ASCII mode so you can see what it what said, it's a log file so lots of stuff in there. And actually, if you close this, you'll be back into the hex editor. Ask about the marking before, so you can just mark stuff here. Now, if you say copy, we'll say it copied, uh, yeah. copied those bytes as uh, hex pairs to the clipboard. If you go to the other side with the cursor, and you copy again, it will, it will be copied as ASCII. So the clipboard support is fairly complete. And if you switch modes again, you could look at it as a uh, disassembly, which is nonsense, of course, in this case, because it's no code. <laughs> you could, if it's an executable, you could uh, actually look at the code this way. So that's a little <coughs> some things about browsing. Uh, you can just close it again. There's some other stuff there. There's a file commander in there, MC, and by default it will, um, the way it works actually is if you boot Puppy Linux it will load all those files that are in the FAT32 file system and it will load them into memory. So that your whole Linux system runs from RAM actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the root directory of your stick that you booted from will be mounted as a, as a device and that's actually being shown here on the left so in, in mount home DFC, actually mount home is the root of your stick you put it from. And mount home DFC is where I put usually put my log files and stuff like that. If you go to the root directory itself, so you go one level up, you'll see those files like 4FS, which is an ext4 file <coughs> system, which has the DFC uh, enhancements. There's a key on there, which is the 
the evaluation key and there's some other stuff and those SFS files are actually the, the DFS puppy system that, that's, that are being loaded on boot from the FAT32 file system and the other one I think is the home directory for the super user which is where the DFC version itself is so, so there's that um, there's also the same thing in the graphical user interface by Linux, so you can use that. And it may have, well normally it also get to the website, uh, but uh, it's a bit tricky here to configure uh, Wi-Fi access. It doesn't do it automatically. <coughs> Some Linux versions do, but this one doesn't. You have to go to setup and then select the network and do lots of things manually. If it works, you can usually get on the network fairly easy. Okay, I think that's about it. And it's, uh, we're Lunch is overtime. here, so no? perfect timing. Okay. Lunch is here. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, so I will tell you about another difficulty of using the USB version that I had, mm -hmm. which is if you want to save stuff, yeah. everything basically has to go in a file, then you have to do post-process. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to load other programs into this running Linux system, a file editor, something like that? Simultaneously. So as things happen, I can actually be yeah, that, that creating the, the, again, the, the message to you yeah. to say, what does this all mean? Yeah, but okay. again, again, that's because you're using the old version, that's DOS. DOS is a single task, right. task so thing. Right, so this one. This is multi-user. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can load, for example, a text editor. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can start a hex edit here, or I can, I can do lots of things simultaneously. I can uh, go to an editor here, whatever. It's, it's a multitasking operating system. It's a full running Linux. You can go onto the internet directly, and you can you can do whatever you want. And what about uh, network access? You're talking yeah. about Wi-Fi. What about a uh, yeah, yeah, wired can, LAN? Yeah, you can just go into... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you want one. Sure uh, you can just go into the setup here and, and, and go through network and then uh, set it up. Okay, so it will recognize all the stuff in the, in the hardware then. We can use it. Or yeah, it, it's a full running li Linux. It even has text processing and stuff. That, uh, <laughs> Okay, then that's about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, what, one more thing to mention if you shut down this uh, thing. Um, because it's, uh, it, it all runs in memory, that means that any changes that you make uh, will be lost. All the things that you write to the stick, so if you use that uh, mount uh, home DFC thing will be still on the stick, so they'll be persistent. But all the things you change in the, in the user interface or on the desktop or whatever will be lost if you shut down. Uh, except if you use the uh, <coughs> save. I think by default it will save, but that will over time it will clutter up stuff. So if you know I didn't intentionally change anything, just say no save, and it shuts down fairly quickly. Otherwise. It yeah, there's, down there's a prompt that you couldn't see up on the projector. Yeah. It, it prompts oh, okay. you whether you want yeah. to save it or not. Yeah. Yeah. It will prompt you save or no save. Yeah. Brief announcement, people. Uh, today is my wife's birthday, and I oh. bought her a cake which is about the size of a small car. So <laughs> we'd appreciate it if you could help us to eat it. It'll be in the last room. <laughs> <laughs>